Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Progressive Bitcoiner. I'm your host, Trey Walsh, and today we have on the podcast Ella and Arsh from Generation Bitcoin. Now, Arsh works for the Human Rights Foundation, which, as I mentioned, has some of my favorite people and Bitcoiners working there. It seems like every week there's a new announcement of uh, a new awesome staff that they've added over there to their organization. And Ella is a student at Cornell, and they both have been involved with Generation Bitcoiners. Arsh is the founder, or the co-founder of Generation Bitcoiners that focuses on Bitcoin education and advocacy for teens, for college students, um, focusing on Bitcoin's positive impacts and things we like to talk about here at the Progressive Bitcoiner. So this episode, we get into just appealing to Gen Z about Bitcoin and why it's so important for Gen Z to consider Bitcoin as a tool uh, to help them in their life uh, with a big uncertain future for this generation um, in terms of world affairs and things like that. So we just have a really great and open conversation about Bitcoin as a tool for human rights, as a tool for this generation, and so much more. So I really encourage you to check this episode out um, and our others that focus on similar topics as well. And if you have any questions or feedback on the episode, you can always reach out to me at hello at progressivebitcoiner.com. And as always, be sure to check out our promo links as well, including the promo link for $50 off any miner with our SAS mining promo link which you can find in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. Um, and as always now, we're uh, recording these live via zap.stream. So if you miss this live recording, that's okay. Uh, we'll be publishing and posting about live recordings coming up as well that you can check out. And if you always miss our live recordings, you can check them out in the ways that you are right now via our YouTube channel or our pod streaming channels, wherever you listen to your podcast. All right, I'll let you get to the episode and we'll see you again next week. Hey, Ella and Arsh, welcome to the Progressive Bitcoiner. How are you? Hey, Trey. Doing well, thanks. Good, yeah. Thanks Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Super excited to talk with you both. Um, More and more folks, I think, are seeing uh, both of your names and and what you all have been up to in the Bitcoin space. And just in general, there's always a lot of excitement when folks see young people uh, getting into into Bitcoin um, in the noise of, of crypto, in the noise of what's going on in the world and the noise of a lot of the FUD that we like to focus on here at the Progressive Bitcoiner. So it, it's really awesome to see um, people seeing that that hope and ability in Bitcoin and so many other things. Um, and there's so many other things that you you both do as well in NARSH at the Human Rights Foundation, which I'd love to talk about, and, and Ella just at, at school and all of these other papers and things that you're focused on. It's been really cool to see you both super involved and active. And I know I've been learning a lot from you both. And I think a lot of people, and I'm, you know, right in the the neck of a millennial. Like I'm, I'm 30, and I know there's people that are much older in the Bitcoin community that they're learning a lot from you both as well. Um, so, I'm really excited for this conversation, and welcome to anybody watching on the live stream as well. So, we 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 stream these episodes now via Zap Stream as well. So, whether you're listening to the recording later on, always remember we're um, doing this via Zap Stream as well for live recordings. But before we jump into the conversation, uh, why don't we introduce you both for those that might not know. And Ella, we can start with you since you're the next order in my screen here. <laughs> sure, happy to. Um, well, my name is Ella Huff. I'm a junior at Cornell where I'm studying cognitive science. Uh, but really I, I say I sit in my classes and I kind of just think about Bitcoin. Um, I had hoped to have an independent major on Bitcoin that quite hasn't panned out, um, but maybe a thesis. And then outside of school, I work with Arsh on Generation Bitcoin. And then we also, Arsh, I don't know if we're going to talk about this now, but we have a a new project that we've started called the Bitcoin Student Network, um, which is another something we're both working on. And then, uh, you know, just consuming Bitcoin content, reading, writing. Um, So, yes, thanks so much, Trey, for having us on. And I guess we'll turn it over to Arsh. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Trey, again. Um, my name is Arsh. I am the co-founder of Generation Bitcoin, um, and I also work at the Human Rights Foundation. Um, the Human Rights Foundation is a nonprofit based in New York with a focus on um, defending human rights and uh, civil liberties work in particularly authoritarian regimes. Um, we use a lot of technology in our ways to do that. Um, my particular focus at the org is our Bitcoin program or our financial freedom program, um, which I'd love to talk about as well. That's awesome. Um, thank you both again for, for coming on. And uh, uh, Arsh, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you just from 
you know, how, how did you get, how did you get involved with the Human Rights Foundation? I'm curious how that came about. I don't know if I quite know that story. And it's funny because one of my friends as well, Eileen, is now joining you all on the team. So some of my favorite people on the planet are just at the Human Rights Foundation, you know, Bitcoin aside, um, and, and you all focusing a lot on Bitcoin as well, obviously. So just seeing that organization flourish and focus on the things that I think are most important for us to talk about when talking about why Bitcoin. But I, I'd be curious to just hear your your story of um, maybe a little bit of your background, whether it's personal, what you focused on, and then um, how you ended up with the Human Rights Foundation. Yeah. So um, during high school, I co-founded um, Generation Bitcoin with um, Autumn and Ashana. Um, this was actually, I think, over two years ago now. Um, mm -hmm. And based off of that, um, you know, we, our team, we went to Bitcoin Miami, um, last year and my co-founders, Adam and Ashana, got a chance to, um, you know, moderate Elizabeth Stark's panel on the main stage, which was, um, a lot of great, you know, attention for us. Um, mm -hmm. and then naturally, you know, the, the speaking engagements kind of led on, um, and we got invited to the MIT Bitcoin conference um you know to share a project there as well um and that's where i met alex lee um mm -hmm. he you know was kind of the first person who joined the financial freedom team um so at the time it was you know uh, gladstein and alex lee the two alexes um mm -hmm. i got your name involved. isn't alex so they My were comfortable bringing alex. you on even though yeah. you're not alex okay. <laughs> <laughs> no we can't have three alexes yeah yeah, yeah. but it's not start with an a so we'll see if that trend yeah. keeps going well yeah let's see uh, well i mean it did with island but um, <laughs> right yeah that's true <laughs> yeah but um but yeah i mean i i started interning there um you know a bit over a year ago around july of last year um and then i've been full-time for the past few months um and from there, we, you know, we brought on CK, um, mm -hmm. the former, you know, uh, chief operating officer of Bitcoin Magazine, um, just last month. And then we brought on Island a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we brought on Win, um, which is our financial freedom intern. He is from um, Myanmar, and he actually has firsthand experience using Bitcoin, um, you know, to escape the um, the military coup in Myanmar mm -hmm. um I'll definitely share some you know of those resources with you as well which is really cool so effectively yeah, our team has yeah. like doubled in the past like mm -hmm. six weeks um so very exciting times um and yeah it's all about um just expanding our reach and our in our program and being able to you know fund as much as as many developers as we can um do as many external events outreach and kind of get the message out there that you know this is why um you know bitcoin matters like th that's why i kind of joined it because there was obviously i mean there's a lot of speculation in our um generation about you know crypto and, and bitcoin and stuff like that so i wanted something to work on that was you know completely i guess like objective right like you can't like you know when you hear these stories about you know bitcoin enabling people um it's it's kind of hard to pass that down right like it's mm -hmm. the, you can you can talk about energy you can talk about a lot of different sectors but i think one of the more now you know popular topics to talk about is you know bitcoin for human flourishing bitcoin for human rights um and i think it's kind of full circle back to like the why bitcoin thesis so yeah i think i think that's something that's that's very important um in terms of storytelling and um in terms of also just like, you know, supporting developers to keep on um, working on the Bitcoin protocol to make it a better tool for human rights. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I so align with that. I mean, that was the reason, that was probably the reason I got really got down the rabbit hole in Bitcoin was early on hearing Alex Gladstein, probably on, on Peter's podcast originally, um, what Bitcoin did. And hearing the human rights angle. And I was like, oh, that's why it matters. Because before that, I had only heard it in like a crypto bro format. And I was sure. like, that doesn't appeal to me. Like my career is in nonprofits, my career is in focusing on like anti-poverty work, these kind of things. I'm like, that is not for me. And then I was like, well, I do have a lot of student loans. Hmm, I'm looking at like the stock. I'm looking at like what is millennial generation, generation Z. 
you know, what do we have to, to look forward to in terms of like retiring comfortably, like being able to buy a house, just anything in the United States, but, but throughout the West and certainly in, in developing nations as well that get into the IMF and all of that stuff. So it was a little bit practical than hearing that, that thesis of human rights and Bitcoin. I'm like, well, it's, it is hard to refute that, right? If you really understand that there are other real critiques, I think of Bitcoin to talk through and work through, but we got to get through the misinformation first, to even get to that point of like talking about, you know, how, how really is it inclusive? Like how, you know, it's, it's a form of wealth. How, how are we, how is this inclusive? All of these other things. So I, I completely resonate with that. And that's, that's why I'm here doing this. Um, you know, in the United States, when a lot of people hear about Bitcoin, like we don't need it, you know, in terms of like people are using Venmo, Venmo or using PayPal. I think there are many use cases still in the United States that, that make it uh, a great thing, but I completely resonate with that um, so much. And, and thank you for all you're doing for, for, for that. Um, Ella, how, how were you roped in originally to Generation Bitcoin? Besides being in the younger generation, you know, being on a college campus, seeing these things, um, you know, I'm curious how you were initially uh, roped into this. Yes, well, I think, you know, both instances, all huge thanks to Arsh. Um, so I first learned about Bitcoin when I was in high school. It was just in a class called blockchain. And like you said, it was more on like the crypto bro um, supply chain number go mm -hmm. up. And it didn't really resonate with me. Um, yeah. If you don't mind it, me asking yeah. what, uh, sorry for jumping in, what, yeah. um, what context was that? Like what type of type of school and things like this? I'm curious because. Also curious the landscape of education. You know, many many high schools aren't aren't doing that, right? Or, or yes, um, you know, K through twelve schools in the U.S. aren't doing that. Yeah, so I I loved my high school. Um, I went to a school called Miss Porter School, and they are trying to take a newer approach to education. So, for instance, mm -hmm. for better or worse, they've basically gotten rid of AP classes. They kind of start their own certificate tracks, and so I was in the one called Technology Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And okay. basically over your entire three, four years, whatever you have there, you take classes um, on the different kind of strands. And then your senior year, you have to do a capstone project. And so I was doing the innovation strand of that certificate. And so blockchain was the class and it just fulfilled that requirement. Um, and then actually the capstone project we ended up doing it was called Asset. And it was basically like a financial literacy website um, course, because I think it's a very recurring issue that we always talk about is financial education is not taught in schools and it mm -hmm. was an all girls school. And it's definitely not really taught to women or women aren't yeah. um, often brought up, you know, motivated to take control of their own financial um, mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. And so anyways, I was in that certificate. The other certificate is a global studies one. Um, and so that's why I was in that class and then, you know, learned about blockchain, but I wish then that I had learned about the human rights element, just all of, I think, the more important elements of Bitcoin out there. Mm -hmm. um, but then a year later, I went to the Oslo Freedom Forum. And that is when I okay. kind of say that I discovered Bitcoin. I learned about it, heard it in high school, but it wasn't until a year later when I think I actually discovered what it is, you know, like capital B Bitcoin, like why does this actually matter for the world? Um, and then I, so that was... I think I want to say end of May. Um, and then uh, I think my mom was talking on a Twitter space that Arsh happened to be in and it had come up, you know, why is my Twitter handle 21 million for the 21st? Mm -hmm. um, and like a, I had written a piece for Bitcoin mag and like kind of a numbers analytical piece. Um, yep. Coincidences, not coincidences in Bitcoin. Anyways, all that to say, Arsh reached out to my mom, um, told us about Generation Bitcoin. And then I think that July, I joined Arsh and Autumn yep. and Ashana and um, found Generation Bitcoin. So both instances are huge thanks to Arsh and HRF for me being mm -hmm. involved in Bitcoin. Yeah. Ada, I'm sure your mom was like, you have to do this. Like, I can imagine. Oh. I mean, it, it was there like was no, <laughs> no, so there was no, she, well, I also say like my decision to, you know, work for Bitcoin or spend my energy in Bitcoin is not, it's my decision. Like, yeah. yes, I, I love that we can share this together, but there was never a time where she said, Ella, you have to do this or, you know, it, it, I never felt that pressure. It was yeah. totally something I chose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I came back from 
Oslo and that was just a huge turning point. And then I don't know, like I was reading like the federal budget and going down the whole Greg Foss math about Mm -hmm. just so much. Um, So yeah, then Arsh came up, presented the Generation Bitcoin opportunity and it was just an absolute yes, like please, how could I, you know, be helpful or get involved? So yeah. That's incredible. Now, for people that haven't looked into Generation Bitcoin, can you summarize, you know, what the focus is? What are the some some of the things you all are doing week after week, just in terms of this um, nonprofit venture, in terms of the the scope of work and things like that? What are some of the things you all are are focusing on? And then we can talk about, you know, what that's like connecting with this younger generation around Bitcoin. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start and then Arsh, of course, chime in or interrupt. Um, mm-hmm. So I think maybe to I'm reading Broken Money right now. So I have a lot cool. of Lynn Alden in my head. Um, yeah. So to quote, maybe one of the lines is, I think Gen Z, Arsh, I think as, things as well, Gen Z is kind of going to be left holding the bag. We keep, you know, thinking very mm-hmm. short term, oh, the next generation will deal with it. Um, but I, I think Gen Z, like, it's critical that they both learn about Bitcoin and also know how to participate and work in Bitcoin. And so that is really the two pillars of Generation Bitcoin. Like, how do we help Gen Z, the people in high school, um, college, who will kind of be Gen B, like Generation Bitcoin, mm-hmm. learn about Bitcoin because they're not going to see it in their universities and their high school Um and then not just learn, but if they want, like, how do they participate? How can they, you know, really take ownership over elements of the ecosystem? Um, so like Arch, Arch for instance, um, put together a partnership with Bitcoiner Jobs. We've held workshops in the past. Um, and maybe Arch, I don't know if you want to talk about the Bitcoin Student Network now here on more the day-to-day interaction, um, but I'll maybe turn it over to you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so with Generation Bitcoin, um, you know, we've, we've had... Like Ella mentioned, we've had you know job opportunities. We've had workshops. Um, we're still working on a few collaborations. Um, the the one of the main things that we're working on now, um, which is a new initiative called the Bitcoin Students Network, mm-hmm. um, and that aims to connect already existing um, or you know existing in the past, like like clubs that have existed in the past or that are already existing. Um, or to encourage people to create new clubs like in college um, or even in high school. Um, and the focus of the clubs would be to talk about Bitcoin. Um, so a lot of the universities right now, from what we've seen, like they have or have had some sort of like, you know, blockchain or crypto type of club, mm-hmm. um, like more, more, more universities than, than you think. Like, yeah, like there's, there's Berkeley, there's MIT, there's Cornell, um, but even a lot of, you know, the smaller and, um, you know, you know, public and private universities, like they have these sorts of clubs. Um, so we're kind of like, you know, just going around to the, you know, presidents or people that are heavily involved in these clubs. And, you know, the goal is to equip them with, you know, resources and information, um, that they may need to actually talk more about Bitcoin, mm-hmm. um, you know, there, there's only, a, you know, a handful of like actually, you know, like actual Bitcoin only clubs. Um, and I think, you know, being able to cater to like, you know, blockchain or crypto clubs, um, you know, they can, you know, say, hey, like, you know, we'll talk about uh, Bitcoin, too, because because why not? Like, I feel like I feel like when you talk to a generation about Bitcoin, it's kind of just like this old, you know, clunky thing. Um, but we can actually just, you know, describe like how it's still relevant and how there's so many developments on the side and how it actually works. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, you know, little by little, you know, you can kind of just, you know, go to the people who are running these clubs and, you know, encourage them to talk about Bitcoin. Um, so the goal would be to, you know, equip them with, you know, whether that's financial resources or, um, you know, like like books or content and stuff like that um, and try to just encourage them to talk about Bitcoin. So I think that's kind of like the next stepping stone that we're um, trying to get out there in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, So yeah, very, very exciting to, um, you know, be able to go to all the colleges and, you know, the university globally and um, just try to, you know, one by one talk to them and equip them with resources. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, oh, one thing that Ella said that stuck with me, because I think 
you know, if I had to put money on it, timeline wise, it does almost seem this way is, you know, Gen Z, you know, holding the bag at the end of the day, right? So growing up, high school through undergrad for me, we heard a bit like, you know, millennials, uh, you know, Social Security retirement might fall on us. Like what's going to happen? And that, that could happen. But the government keeps being crafty in the United States and kicking the can down the road. So now it does seem like maybe millennials could be okay um, in terms of some of this more catastrophic event that, you know, some Bitcoiners will say is happening next year. I'm not in that camp. Uh, maybe not in our lifetime. But if it were a generation that really should start thinking about these things, it is Gen Z. And I get very passionate and very frustrated when those in in political power are, are not focusing on this issue or not suggesting that there will be a problem or there there is the only conversation is you know full faith in the u.s government full faith in the u.s dollar but you know hey nope it's always been this way it's always going to keep getting this way right so there's a balance between being alarmist and being being practical uh, and education driven i think the way you both are are approaching it because there's there's a lot of hope here as well if you only focus on doom and gloom it's kind of the way i relate to to climate activists as well, right? If you only focus on doom and gloom, how are we going to actually get to those positive steps of making change? I think the same is the, true for Bitcoin here. Like you touched on briefly, right? Like a lot of the issues that are surrounding um, Gen Z, they're either being like, you know, completely um, declined by politicians or, you know, being LARPed to that it's under their control. Mm-hmm. Um, whether whether that's, you know, high inflation, whether that's wealth inequality, um, whether that's any social issues, environmental issues, um, high debt, you know, a lot, a lot of these, these issues are kind of, you know, just like put off to the side. Um, I feel like, you know, um, and I think like Bitcoin has the nature to address a lot of these issues, um, Mm -hmm. in and of itself. Right. I mean, not that, not that Bitcoin can literally fix everything, but, um, I, I think if you highlight the top five issues, maybe, um, for Gen Z, like, Bitcoin has some sort of tie to them um, and can help, you know, debunk those as well. So, And Arsh, I think you, it cut off a little bit for me, but I think you said something like the government kind of has the narrative, oh, we have everything under control and maybe Gen Z will take that. Um, and the reason that stuck out is because I was on a walk with a friend a couple of weeks ago and she said those exact words like, oh, you know, I hope we don't have like our, our world fall apart. I, I, but I think the government has it all in, over, under control and we won't really need to worry about that. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I just thought that like really made my heart kind of stop because so many times people will either say something like that or they'll say, I don't have time to think about this right now. But we know like the sooner you can start just forget Bitcoin, just like traditional finance, the sooner you can start investing, thinking about your future, like the better off you normally are. Um, and I think one of the greatest things Bitcoin gives is it gives you your agency back to have an opinion, to have a voice, to you know make a difference, to solve a problem, and to just say, oh, the government will take care of that, or you know someone else will figure it out. Like That's something I really want to change and kind of a message I think that's central to generation bitcoin and the bitcoin student network like sure we might be scattered all across the globe but we all come to bitcoin for a different reason it it helps us all in a different way but you can kind of come together and work on this um, and kind of take back your agency and, and make a difference hi everyone hope you're enjoying the episode today's episode is brought to you by bitbox now bitbox is a hardware wallet that's open source incredibly secure and easy to use and it's what i'm using to safely secure my bitcoin in cold storage now i know self-custodying bitcoin can really be intimidating but bitbox is designed for ease of use without compromising on security it's USB-C compatible and allows you to easily back up and restore your private keys with a micro sd card which is really cool Now, you can purchase the BitBox using the promo code TPB at the link found in the show notes for 5% off your purchase. And I really want to thank BitBox for their support of the podcast. And I'm really excited about this new partnership. All right, I'll let you get back to the episode now. And when Arsh was talking about, you know, Bitcoin doesn't fix everything, I went through this period where have you seen those charts where it's like basically saying someone is uneducated and then they think they know everything and then they're like a sage and wise again. So for me, it's kind of like, okay, starts off Bitcoin fixes everything. Um, and then you go up and it's like, no, Bitcoin doesn't fix everything. You come back down. It's like Bitcoin fixes everything. So I'm, I'm more in that camp again, where I'm like, I feel like every month that comes out and it's included in some mainstream narratives, you hear some new way of 
Bitcoin addressing something that we're like, how? Like the big wave was a year, year and a half ago. I mean, even beyond, but more mainstream a year, year and a half ago, more of the climate action stuff started coming out about Bitcoin, about methane flaring, about technologies, about market incentives to address uh, carbon emissions and address uh, renewable energy um, grids and things like that. So that was a that was a big wave. And then we just hear all, all these other things like talking with uh, Lisa, your mom, and then Dom talking about like pension funds and just appealing to people like when the market is just going going crazy and bonds and all these other things, seeing Bitcoin as a flight to safety from some of the biggest risk at, asset managers saying these things. Wild, like would not have anticipated things like that being said even six months ago are now being said. So, so more and more, I, I definitely am much more in the camp of let's be realistic and let's talk to people where they're actually at rather than just making Bitcoin sound like it's this cult. So, you know, I'm still not crazy about saying, you know, Bitcoin fixes everything, but going issue by issue, you can say how Bitcoin can start to address certain things. And that's becoming more and more real when myself as a millennial, I'll just state my own experience. And I was big thinking about, the Bernie campaign, I've mentioned this a lot, thinking about, you know, all of these things even coming through with the Biden administration on student loan forgiveness, which I know is like a controversial topic. But my, my point is, there's a lot of things that are talked to the younger generation about, oh, these government policies are going to fix this. And here's why. Well, haven't we spent enough time seeing that things didn't change after Occupy Wall Street? Things that, Now, that doesn't mean there isn't a place for some government policy and intervention um, in, in certain aspects. And, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with those debates and talking about that. The point is, if that is your, your only hope and point, if that's your only hope to address climate change, we're not, if that's important to you, we're not going to get there. That's not going to happen. That's your only a point to address your own financial situation or your own housing situation um, or your own national security. That's not going to get there. Like it isn't this omniscient, all powerful being. Um, and I think we've seen that time and time again, after 9-11, especially, I think people can see the empire of the United States it is not what people may think. And it continues to collapse metaphorically and physically in, in different ways. Bitcoin creates, creates hope at the end of the day when there might not be hope in this old system. I think that's one of the most hopeful opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. And this kind of just popped in my mind. Like, so often, I think we, we talk about... Um, there's the negative uh, messages in media about Bitcoin uses too much energy, Bitcoin funds terrorist organizations, all this stuff that's just not helpful, not true, that we have to spend a lot of time debunking. And I, mm -hmm. I wish we could have that space where we talk about actual challenges in Bitcoin, where we can, because it, it doesn't just fix everything, just like, just like it didn't come into being because of, you know, eight pages. It was years and years of different inventions that were put together. So it would be nice if we could have a space where like, let's actually talk about the issues that are real issues, real challenges so that it can fix more and more progressively. Yeah, I think we still haven't hit that point yet. And I, I remind people, A, 90 to 95% of people still don't know even beyond that Bitcoin's this thing. You know, so some of the things we talk about, I have to remind myself, okay, like a lot of people don't even know that it, it, it's in conversations around human rights. And what do you mean? climate crisis and Bitcoin, like, isn't that a part of the problem? You know, all of these things in my, my left circles and things like that, that I've had to talk to friends about. And it's only 14 years old, like a monetary revolution. One of the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest technological revolutions ever talking about money since gold, um, that's going to take a little bit of time. So I think patience for Bitcoiners is really important as well. And just whatever you're doing in in Bitcoin, um, just persistently doing it week after week and trying to sustain it because it is exhausting, right? I, I, I try to fight exhaustion in the things you're talking about, right? And I, I believe that 100% is like we can't even get to some of the real issues, right? Because there's a lot of things that I'm concerned Bitcoin doesn't necessarily fix. One of them is like political power, lobbying influence, um, politics in the United States. These are things that Bitcoin doesn't necessarily fix, you know, we have to tra change some laws and the way we run things um, and the way that congressional leaders act and money and politics. It's, it's different. Um, I'm sure there's creative ways that Bitcoin can fix it. But to get to that point, we have to stop having um, so many mainstream sources and very influential people just saying not even close to, to truths about, about Bitcoin 
understanding that Bitcoin and crypto are two different things. We're still in those beginning stages in a lot of ways in the, in the mainstream world. And it kind of reminds me of how if there's a new concept in philosophy that's at a mainstream philosopher at like Harvard or Yale or whoever, it takes 50, 60, 70 years for that to trickle into mainstream culture in terms of some sort of new philosophical movement or new psychological movement. I think the same is of Bitcoin, if not longer. So with Bitcoin, we'll see a lot of price action that gets people excited and pulled in, things like that. But in terms of a lot of these things, it takes a tremendous amount of time and patience. And I, I can't echo that enough to the listeners who are like, when? Like, we know these things. When is it going to happen? Um, it, it, it takes patience for, for sure. And folks like you doing this work day in and day out, which is commendable. I think, I think like you touched on earlier, right? Like a lot of the takes from the mainstream, um, I, I think it just gets more intellectually dishonest, you know, as, as we go on, like, I don't know. It gets like, desperate. That's what I, hear. yeah, it sounds more and more desperate, I mean, but I think like, I mean, and it could be frustrating, right. But I think, you know, like, like you touched on as well, I, I, I kind of like to take a step back sometimes and say, okay, like we're, we're 14 years into this thing and you know, look how far we've actually come, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. I think, I think, I mean, cause it can't, it's something that can't be dismissed anymore for sure. I mean, you have to look at it, whether you're a politician, um, you're, you're, a, you're a policymaker, you're in the financial system. Um, there's so many, you know, you know, NGOs and there's so many coalitions now that are moving the space forward. Um, you know, even, even from the development side, right? Like year over year, if you look at the user experience and you look at the, the, the interfaces for a lot of, you know, Bitcoin app ecosystems, they just continue to develop and continue to develop, um, yeah. you know, with the, with the support of a lot of organizations or, um, you know, people who are, you know, working on open source projects. Um, and I think that's huge because it makes Bitcoin, you know, brick by brick, uh, you know, a better tool um, to be able to use. So I think, I think in 14 years, I mean, we're doing pretty good, <laughs> but it is, it is kind of, um, frustrating as well to hear some of these takes, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be an uphill battle, but I think, um, nonetheless, like we should still, uh, definitely, definitely be bullish on, you know, Bitcoin achieving a spot in pretty much every sector for sure. Mm -hmm. Ella, were you going to chime in on that? No, I know. I was just going to say yes. I can agree. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are, I, I've touched on this with, with you, Ella, before and with, with so many people, but what do you think are some of the leading misconceptions? I mean, I, 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 can, I can guess, but hearing from you both, what are some of the leading misconceptions with, with young people that um, are hesitant about Bitcoin, whether they're good, good or not, right? Maybe they are some, some good critiques. Um, but what are some common misconceptions and critiques of, of Bitcoin that you think, um, whether it's in personal experience through this work or just things that you know that, that Gen Z is really battling with in terms of, of Bitcoin or just hearing about Bitcoin? Yeah, Ali, you can go ahead first. Okay, okay. Um, but I, know, I know I've said in the past just very basics like people think you have to buy a whole bitcoin initially and they, mm -hmm. that's just kind of a big one um, can we can we pause on that point sure. before i lose this what are yeah. your thoughts on you know sat standard versus versus bitcoin standard do you guys have feelings on this uh, <laughs> <laughs> or like or terminology um gosh i won't even go into the bits thing um but j just in terms of like silly things like that these things are so yeah. psychological that's a good point though it's been a while since i've talked about this yeah, I think there's maybe just generally in Bitcoin, there's a lot of nuances, like just capital B Bitcoin, lowercase b Bitcoin, mm -hmm. you know, Satoshis, like there's a lot of nuances that you don't really find out about, I think, until you've been in the space for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I've said this in the past, but most people our age, like, we haven't worked for years. We don't have our nest egg yet. You know, we don't like we don't have that much money. And so when we see, OK, you know. 34,000 Bitcoin price Bitcoin or, um, I don't know, a dollar X coin, whatever it is, like mm -hmm. you might think, oh, you know, I can't, I can't afford Bitcoin. I'm not going to go to that. Um, so that's just kind of like a big one. And if you feel like you can't buy it there, maybe you're not interested in learning more about it. Or I don't, sometimes if you own something, you're more inclined to do your research and study and learn about it. Yeah. Um, so that's just an initial one. Um, I guess also just 
even traditional finance, people don't know, like just generally in Bitcoin, you come into this space and then you realize how much you don't know. Mm -hmm. And I guess sometimes that can be a little off-putting if you're someone who's in school all day and you, you spend your days learning and maybe you want to come home and you know not feel like you're even more clueless. Um, but then energy. So we just had... Um, so I'm the head of recruitment at Cornell Blockchain, which means I also teach all of the new member education process, mm -hmm. which is like eight weeks. Um, and so at our G body meeting on Tuesday, they had to do like a quick challenge, you know, not given a ton of time. What are what is an improvement you would have to Bitcoin or Ethereum or just blockchain generally? Mm -hmm. And hands down, energy just is an overwhelming um, topic that comes up. And I think part of it's like, do you, do they really know why energy is bad in their mind? Like, sure, Bitcoin uses energy, but are you just saying that because you've heard it? Or like, mm -hmm. why actually do you think energy usage is a bad thing? Um, and so in two weeks, I'm going to do like a Bitcoin and energy lecture. And then we also, this is very exciting, um, Stranded. I don't know if you've heard about this, but kind of the short film, which is a precursor to Dirty Coin. Um, okay. They, I don't think I, I've heard of Dirty Coin, but not the other one. Yeah. So, so Stranded is a 17 minute um, short film precursor to Dirty Coin. And okay. we are going to be screening it um, here at Cornell. And we're going to have a panel that will follow it. Um, oh, that's awesome. So that'll be really exciting. And I think just having these experts come in and talk about mm. Bitcoin and energy, you know, better than I can, I think will really help to kind of, um, tamper down those misconceptions and just make them think about energy in a new way. Yeah. Well, um, Arsh, why don't I kick it over to you? What are, what are your thoughts on, on misconceptions? I figured energy would be close to number one, if not number one. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, regardless of someone's take on, you know, the energy crisis or um, the energy usage or global warming, I just, I just think, you know, when you're, like like Ella, right? Like if you're in a class and you're, you know, just picture an auditorium with a bunch of, you know, students with their laptops out next to their phones, next to their AirPods, right? Look, looking at a screen with lights, with with air conditioning, right? Like at an Ivy League school, yeah, right? Like yeah. and energy, energy progresses, right? Like you need you need energy to actually be able to progress. Um, so I, I just think it's, you know, I just think it's, it's, it's fun when you're, when you're seeing, um, these, you know, these types of things. Um, and you know, the, the reason why it was first afforded to you in the first place was, was energy. Um, so I just think it's, it's something that it's, it's an easy, it's an easy pick, right? Like people have been debunking this, like for like Bitcoin has been around for 14 years. I feel like people have been debunking this for like 15 years. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> like, like it's just, you know, you can talk about it over and over again. It's like, it's like when you see a, you know, a capitalism sucks sticker on a, on a MacBook, right? <laughs> it's just kind of like the same, same thing over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I like b besides, Listen, besides and in college, that, I probably would have done that. Like in college, I probably, I didn't literally, but like, I was like sociology like trained by like marxists in college. it's funny when i was on peter's podcast what bitcoin did i mention that and he's like are you a commie that was like his, his second question and i was like no not really anymore you know that was i don't want to joke and say it was a college phase because there's there's a lot of thoughts that have carried but like sure. i i under i understand that like you want people want change so bad like it comes from a place of heart and passion and care let's try to direct that in a way that like actually does something though that's the biggest thing Definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I think just, just like, like politics in general too, right? Like, I think it, it can get to this point where once you start to understand Bitcoin as well, like it may not be the left versus right. It may actually, you know, be them versus you. Um, mm -hmm. And I, like, I think you, you start to like become inclined to the fact that like you may not become, you know, sort of a, a part of an, a party like i think my like political journey as well like it's just kind of been offset by bitcoin a little bit um mm -hmm. to the point where it's like okay like where do i fall on like the political spectrum um you know i guess i'm a bitcoiner like i think i think mm -hmm. like like you know f coming along with like bitcoin uh values um in that sense is 
is, is something that's worthwhile um you know when you're kind of studying bitcoin um other i think i think other misconceptions um or like big heading points right like as you said like when people think about bitcoin they may think about like a value transfer protocol like sending and receiving money um so you know my my friends and you know people in gen z like obviously like it takes you know two seconds to set up a venmo everyone has multiple different fintech apps um so there's there's pretty much like no need for you know bitcoin in that transacting realm um at least at least you know in the in the united states and in the western world um so then it kind of comes down to using it as a savings technology um which you know again gets i I think kind of gets offset by the unit bias like like ella touched on right so um it's kind of just like okay you know, save, save in this, try to achieve, you know, a million sats um, or, you know, 10 million sats, like kind of, kind of go piece by piece um, and think about it in terms of sats. Um, and I think, I think like last bull market as well, like when we saw a lot of the, the NFT craze and we saw a lot of the crypto craze, um, obviously that's died down. I, I wonder why, um, <laughs> but um yeah like i think it's it's all cyclical like people people will come back to this um but it kind of gives more and more time right to like build out new tools and new initiatives for um people to learn about bitcoin and start getting curious about it and thinking long term too right because i think once once people graduate high school when they're in college they may start thinking long term when they start to you know open their bank accounts when they um get their first jobs actually owning their own money and being like, okay, like I'm an adult now. Like, let me start thinking about ways to invest or preserve. I mean, like, like hope, hopefully, um, you know, that, that's something that people will, will think about given the, um, like the political nature as well surrounding our generation. Yeah. It's, I'm just thinking about like, so like, like Cornell, like just, you know, I love New York city. It's like one of my favorite places. Um, have you have you done any uh, like I'm I'm interested to see if if uh, you folks have done anything with like PubKey down in, in New York City as well? Um, that'd be very cool. No, we haven't. So there is um, Cornell Tech, and I want to say it came up. It's on Roosevelt Island. I want to say PubKey mm-hmm. kind of came up in a discussion we had at one point. I may be mixing conversations, but we haven't. Um, I guess the closest thing to New York City that we have will happen next week. Um, the Wolf. Um, you know, Bitcoin Lightning Accelerator is going to come and speak to nice. the club, yep. so that will be very exciting. Um, but yeah, it's it's not that far, but it's surprisingly a little difficult to get to New York City when maybe you don't have a car and just yeah, 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 transportation. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, well, just thinking about even even myself in college and Gen Z, I think it's just only gotten even more angsty and frustrating because those problems continue to exist. Like I was an undergrad in like 2010. So a lot of the, those problems and issues just have amplified. So it's like, I think my frustration, it's almost in large part, it's like the frustration I feel with like the Elizabeth Warren camp of like, what are you, what are you missing here in terms of like the potential for your influence and reach to, to see that Bitcoin is a lot of the answers that you were trying to solve with this, the, the banking crisis with the, it's this amount of frustration. Same thing for young people, whether it's climate crisis, whether it's just government, um, whether it's surveillance, whether it's the police state, all of these things. I'm like, please, please, please try to wake up to at least what we're trying to do with Bitcoin or or through Bitcoin or understand some of these problems, because it it pains me to see people just running up a hill that they'll never get to the top um, because you're operating in that same system. And we've just seen over and over again, it's a broken system and it's going to lead to nowhere. And then people usually give up or throw their hands up or they're so tired and exhausted. Like Bitcoin is that way to have that, this extreme tool that can be used to where you can keep carrying that torch. And I, I, depends on the day. Sometimes I feel very hopeful and optimistic about that. Some days I'm like, man, they're, uh, they're just getting started with ratcheting up um, the attacks on this, whether it's, whether it's mainstream, whether it's psychological, whether it's literally government involved, um, all of these things, we're, we're still, there's still a lot of unknowns about that. For sure, at least at least I think. But but what do you both feel about about that in terms of resistance to Bitcoin 
whether it's culturally, which the government has for many, many, many years, a very long time since its history, used propaganda to, to squelch things, right? So it's not just like, oh, the government can turn Bitcoin off. Clearly it can't. Yes, they can regulate things to make it almost unusable or to keep it in an ETF world and that's it. Um, but they can all use, also use propaganda <laughs> so that a general mass can say, wow, Bitcoin is bad. Let's get it out of here. You know, red scare tactics, um, another witch hunt, things like that. Where do you both feel about about that? Obviously, I'm going to assume you're hopeful. That's why you're doing some of this. But what are some of the worries you have about Bitcoin's resistance movement? And are, are there any? Yeah, I feel like Arsh is going to have a very good answer here. So maybe I'll, I'll go first and just be quick about it. Um, but I think there's a lot of resistance to Bitcoin with just all the stigma attached because Bitcoin, it's not just here like Ethereum, like, oh, you know, we just want to build decentralized apps and just we're just, we're just here to build. Like Bitcoin mm -hmm. is here to actually tackle really difficult problems. And so like mm -hmm. you talk about money, politics, energy, like Bitcoin doesn't beat around the bush. It kind of just gets into things. And so I think there's a lot of stigma that just people are kind of resistant to dive in there and it's hard. Um, and actually, so I was in a class this morning and it was psychology class and it was just talking about like confirmation bias and what is it going to take to kind of get people, um, like how, how do you get people to change their minds? Like what does that really look like? And so the idea was kind of when you're faced with some information that you agree with, like you just kind of use like someone forwards you an article and it's aligns with your beliefs. You say, um, you know, can I believe this? And you, you don't, you're kind of just like, yeah, I can. Um, but if you get something that goes against your beliefs, you think from a mindset of, you know, must I believe this? And you're, so you just have different ways of interacting with information. Um, and so it's, hard that Bitcoin really challenges you and the beliefs you've held for a long time and maybe all the people around you also believe. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that they, the professor kind of presented that, you know, how do we overcome this um, is kind of through relationship, relationships and you kind of have to build up that trust and, you know, oh, this person who I respect and who normally holds good beliefs, you know, they think this, why don't I? And so just from Bitcoin's nature that it is all about trust, you know, don't trust verify. Like I found that to just sitting in class, like I found that to be helpful that the way, you know, he thought about how do we overcome any of our confirmation bias or think about new things is rooted in trust. And that is just a huge tenet of Bitcoin. I found that very reassuring. Um, so, yeah, anyways, there's a lot of, I think, resistance because Bitcoin gets it really personal issues to people. Um but I think it will take a long time probably to overcome. But the fact that it's aligned with trust is very promising. So yes, I remain very hopeful. And I also think particularly people our age and just they're curious. Like I think Gen Z, um, you know, wants to understand how things work, not just like privacy. Gen Z definitely kind of thinks about. So yeah, sorry, that was a long way to say it. I think it will take a decent amount of time, but I do think in the end it will. I'm hopeful about the end outcome. I think I think globally, like if you kind of take a step back and like look at, you know, the use for for Bitcoin, right? Like, so so we we've been touching on kind of like a like a Western like political, um, you know, ideology, like you know, Senator Warren, the Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal, um, you know, Bitcoin using, you know, terrorist groups using Bitcoin. Oh no. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I th if I think like once you start to look at other um, political climates, like, but, like they, I mean, they don't typically have the discussions. Like from from what I've seen, like people people don't have a, don't typically have these discussions. Like if you're sitting, um, you know, in you know, if you're sitting in a, in a technology hub in you know Nigeria, you're you're not going to be talking about. Like oh like look at the new Wall Street Journal <laughs> article like you're you're going to be talking about like ways to continue building how to, how to use Bitcoin um you know because a lot of a lot of the places on on Earth who actually have um you know a need for Bitcoin um I don't think that's a speculative need like that's actually like a desire for it mm -hmm. and not not a preference um so to overcome like I guess the the force of saying that hey like you know bitcoin may not be valuable here 
or you know like how should we go about using bitcoin do we want an etf um i think all all it takes is you know maybe a couple good stories to to reel people in to thinking about the bigger picture of bitcoin like i think i think sometimes you know bitcoin for its own good kind of moves a little um too quick in um the mainstream or you know within different sectors um but it's good to like take a step back and look at the bigger picture of kind of why people are using Bitcoin globally, whether that's for Mm -hmm. uh, financial surveillance, you know, high inflation, capital controls. Um, There's a number of needs, but the the good thing that makes Bitcoin unique is that Bitcoin is kind of just this tool that's here. um, And, you know, that's, that's, you know, that you can use and no one's kind of like forcing you to to use it or, um, you know, there's not some like, like marketing company behind it or there's not like a foundation behind it like it's just kind of there and it, mm-hmm. it, it it moves at its at its own force and everyone else kind of just like draws the narratives and um the conclusions around it and, yeah that's go ahead ella go ahead. oh no actually it's kind of a risk for me to bring this up because i i was just learning this in a class and i don't know if i'm gonna be able to present this so well but like arshi were saying like it, it's just kind of a tool to there and it tool for you to use and it's kind of in everyone's self-interest to use it in the way that makes sense for them um but what i was going to add is so i'm in a game theory class right now and it's um talking about like if everyone knows if you, you have a game um and everyone knows that you're going to act in the best interest for yourself you're going to act rationally like that's what's called just common knowledge and so if you have a finite game where the game could end um, you will cooperate until the last instant, last instance of the game when you could actually earn more by defecting. That's kind of the layout. Like everyone knows that that's what you're going to do because mm-hmm. you are going to play in your self interest and you're going to try to get the most you can. But the problem is, is that if everyone knows in the last period they're going to defect and try and get more, then you know what's the other player going to do? They're going to also defect, and so this is where you get into kind of backward induction where you're never going to cooperate because you just know, okay, in the next period, they're going to do something to serve themselves and not me. Um, My point to Bitcoin is that like Bitcoin is an infinite game. We don't have a last period where you can defect and, you know, go kind of try and cheat someone else over it. And so ultimately I think Sure, there's resistance to Bitcoin, but in the long run, you know, there, there is no last period. It will be in your interest to cooperate and not resist. Um, like there won't be a case for that backward induction to arise. So, yeah, sorry, that maybe was not presented so well, but I, I think there's a lot of resistance right now. But we just haven't thought long term yet or really because like we've mentioned, we're so new, they're so early. There's only 14 years so far. Um so and maybe maybe I'll stop talking there, but I think that's a promising um, way to think about it too. Yeah, and my hope for the younger generation, especially, but this applies to everyone I think who are really Bitcoiners. The one commonality, and it could be viewed as we have a negative view of the world, but it could be viewed as we have a realistic view, and there's hope within this system, and this is a way to work with it. Speaking of game theory is the assumption that people are self-interested and self-motivated. And I think that's been a struggle for me, whether it's with my own friends or with climate activists and with folks that I've worked with and talked to before or people in the nonprofit space that I'm in that, you know, we're, we're fighting and trying to figure out what's the best way to address poverty, like in the city of Boston, where I do a lot of my work or um, just throughout the United States or throughout the world in South Africa, in Uganda, in, in China, addressing different things. Like, I think some people, I'm, I'm very interested, like I think the younger generation has seen ways in which the world is, is fixed for the rich, right? Let's use that as an example. Assuming that, why isn't a tool that can be really, really good, as Alex Gladstein recently said to me, like, man, Bitcoin is a great tool for the little guy. Like knowing that it can be such a good tool for the, the little guy, knowing that we can bet that those in power are self-motivated and self-interested. Like, I could care less Larry Fink's opinion on something from BlackRock, but the fact that I know at the end of the day, the way markets work, the way way our world works, they're thinking of shareholder value and the way to get rich. Bitcoin is that Trojan horse of it will make people fabulously wealthy. 
so they can be motivated by that. But it also give incredible rights and access to folks that really need to use it, as Arsh was mentioning. So I'm wondering why the younger generation, for those that might be resistant to, to Bitcoin or trying these old methods of uh, effective change and revolution, don't see, we, we can't assume that at the end of the day, okay, these, these rich folks or whoever um, are just going to say, oh, we're going to do the right thing. Okay, we're not going to be motivated by greed, or we're not going to be motivated to drill more oil because A, we need to, and A, we're making money, whatever their cause is. Assume the motivation is continuing to play the game as it is. Bitcoin is this incredible hack to appeal to both sides in this beautiful way. Um, and, and I'm just surprised people haven't woken up to that yet. It's really been surprising to me because once I did with Alex Gladstein's Trojan, you know, other people have talked about, but the Trojan horse of like, okay, the Trojan horse delivered to dictators. Oh my gosh, the Bitcoin. And then, you know, you have the little plebs inside, you know, that, that to me is what, what sticks with me. Like, why aren't people waking up to that? I don't know if you have an answer, but I'm genuinely curious. I, I still can't figure it out. I'm, I know I'm really sucked into the Bitcoin world, but um, talking with my friends, it's like I'm still trying to figure that out. Yeah. Would, would you mind rephrasing the question, actually? Yeah. So basically, why haven't people figured out that, or especially the younger generation, um, that people are going to be self-motivated and self-interested and that's also actually in bitcoin's favor like we can't assume at the end of the day that people are gonna quote do the right thing without this market motivation without this money motivation that bitcoin brings like they're not going to just automatically say okay we're going to drop to all renewable energy or whatever the case is right without some market motivation without some reason to use that renewable energy all these things that bitcoin can start solving like people and uh, people businesses, governments are self-motivated. That works in Bitcoin's favor. So I'm wondering why people haven't figured that out yet and seen that, that Bitcoin is that, that life hack. Um, I think people are assuming that governments are just going to stop going to war and that you know the, the dollar is not going to continue to be devalued and that businesses are not going to be greedy. You know, those things. It's like Bitcoin actually uses that for good right. at the end of the day. So I'm wondering why people haven't woken up to that. Right. I, I don't, I'm not sure if I have like a direct answer to that, but I would say that like on the surface level, like I think generally, you know, younger people kind of recognize the fact that, um, you know, governments and, you know, certain parties may, may be pushing um, that, that narrative around Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, I mean, they, they, they do kind of understand like, the like like i said like the surface level of the problems that we're facing um and i think like we're looking for solutions so like gen z is looking for solutions they recognize the problems um but it's, it just comes down to like how they can actually you know be equipped to like kind of think about these things because i think pe different people think about things in different ways um so for it to be maybe culturally relevant to them or politically relevant to them um it just it's just kind of, it just kind of depends on you know what their force would would be to coming to that you know realization um in the first place if, if that kind of makes sense um ella i'm curious to know you'll, you'll probably have a better answer than i will but uh what what do you think about that yeah, I have a couple, I don't know, different thoughts in different areas. I think one, like we've sort of talked about, it hugely depends where you're from, how you've grown up, like what part of the world are you from, what, are you, what have your life experiences been? I think that definitely changes your timeline on when you wake up to Bitcoin and, mm -hmm. you know, how people are motivated to interact with it. Um, but just thinking about in the West, I think the education system just doesn't encourage critical thinking very well. I mean, definitely not. Like I studied in China for a bit, definitely not there. Um, we have, we're so, you know, so many different, different things we interact with are very high time preference also. Like, I mean, I don't know, just like Google telling you how fast it got the search result, result or social media or, I mean, we're so obsessed with being busy also. Like everyone at school, like you, your Google calendar needs to be filled to the max. Like it, there's mm -hmm. so like so I think that's a huge thing just thinking like why haven't we woken up why haven't we realized that Bitcoin is kind of a hack um because we haven't just sat down to think and maybe we also don't even know 
how to begin thinking, like what are the questions we should ask? And once you're willing to give time to Bitcoin, you find those questions that you should ask um, and maybe what misconceptions you've held. Um, but yeah, I, I think yeah, critical thinking is definitely a huge one. And so I was messaging with someone yesterday and they said a phrase, which I have to steal because I think it's incredible, but it was um, basically free time is your call option on future opportunities. And so I think with just the high time preference, like I got to, um, you know, think short term, I need to be busy, I need to do this and that. And we just, we don't think <laughs> we're not giving ourselves space for new opportunities or, you know, new possibilities. Um, so yeah, a little bit harsh what you were saying, but that's where, that's where I kind of am right now. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I, I think in terms of that short time preference, it's also what makes us so reactionary. Um, just as a, as a culture, it, it applies intergenerationally at this point, um, for, for years and years amplified by social media, amplified by so many things like when some sort of disaster or controversial thing happens, it's almost like people feel the need. You have to have an immediate reaction an immediate synthesis of the entire situation and put your opinion out immediately and stick with it. Uh, again, whether you're a politician, like, you know, speaking of Hamas and crypto, right? Some politicians read a Wall Street Journal article that was factually inaccurate. They wrote a letter a few hours later, next day. It was probably drafted literally two hours after. I was trying to do the timing in my head. I was like, their staff did a quick turnaround on this. That's like, that's pretty serious um, to, to try to suggest to change some sort of legislation or, or action in FinCEN uh, based on an article that ended up being inaccurate because you're like, we got to jump on this uh, because it sounded, it sounded nice. It sounded like a nice thing to say that you know, dark crypto is funding terrorism. Boom. Let's, let's do something about this or just any culture's reaction to anything, um, social issues in the U S. And the reason I talk about a lot of these things is for better or for worse, like a lot of our audience are people in the West folks listen to podcasts in general that talk about Bitcoin, but also, um, just, you know, our progressive audience folks in the U S it's U S UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and, and Europe. Uh, we're getting a little bit of a larger Europe audience as well, but speaking to the, to the West here, trying to help folks in the West also understand, as Ar said, you got to take a step back, like look at what Bitcoin really is. But that immediate reaction is like every episode I've done of this podcast for a while now, critical thinking has come up as in like, how do we teach critical thinking? I think it's come up in every episode, at least the past five or six ones. Uh, and Bradley Rettler and I jumped into it a little bit more since he's a philosophy professor talking about how do we even begin to address that? Because I see it as such a, a critical problem. Um, but you're spot on, Ella. It's like, that is a problem in being able to even have some of these conversations to begin with, with no easy answers here. Like, I don't know if Bitcoin fixes that, you know, because we can't even get to Bitcoin uh, unless you take a step back and teach people to sit for a little bit. But I also, so I don't know, I also kind of challenge in my own brain, like, we don't really know how money works. And so I also think with Gen Z, you know, I don't need every Gen Z person to be an expert on Bitcoin. It's yeah. okay if they don't. Bitcoin's not their thing, but I just, every, all 8 billion people have the right to know about Bitcoin, Bitcoin as a tool to secure their financial freedom, just secure their freedom. Um, or she said this earlier, like Bitcoin's a huge tool to human flourishing. And so everyone has a right to know that. And I think that's why, you know, I feel so passionate about this mission and, you know, Bitcoin, but yeah, it's also, it's also okay if that's all they just kind of save in it and that's all it is. And they go do their mm -hmm. other thing. Like that's a huge yeah. win. Also, if you can just do what you feel like you're called to doing. Yeah. Yeah, you don't which, have to be like a, a Bitcoiner. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, which may be like bound to change over time too, right? Like if someone may acquire Bitcoin for one reason, uh, that reason could change down the line as as well mm -hmm. um, and evolve to something else, um, which, you know, could affect, you know, maybe your Bitcoin holdings proportionately or, um, you know, what you do with your Bitcoin, the reason why you even hold Bitcoin kind of evolves. Um, so I think like, you know, from, from what I've seen, like when, when people start to, you know, kind of get their initial sats, then it kind of gets them thinking because they have skin in the game. Um, and it kind of takes them, you know, down the, this rabbit hole. So I think it's, it's at least good to touch on like why people should at least just give this a look. Um, and, I, and I think it's going to come to the point where like a lot of people, you know, may, may have to give, give it a look, uh, you know, for one way 
or, or another, like whether, whether that's a bull market coming, um, you know, and it encourages people to look at it again, um, whether that's a um, very false and intellectually dishonest uh, Wall Street Journal article that comes out talking about it. Um, for, for, for one reason or another, I think this, you know, people are going to be tempted to give it another look. Um, because I had, I mean, I had conversations with people about Bitcoin, you know, a, a long time ago. Um, but then, you know, when Bitcoin goes up 20% overnight, like it did, like, you know, this past week, like incentives kind of drive them to say, oh, you know, Arsh, like, what was that, you know, Bitcoin thing that, that you were talking about? And I think that's like a natural force within, within humans as, as well, um, to kind of look at the incentive within, you know, their jurisdiction and, and within within their ideology and then kind of take it back to, okay, like, let me revisit this thing. So I think it's something that can't be dismissed over, over a long term, but maybe something that people may keep on looking at over and over again until they figure out kind of like the why. Um, but it, it also comes to the education, right? Like, I think I'm, I'm, I'm definitely bullish on like, you know, financial literacy, um and you know bitcoin's impact on financial literacy um which you know can be talked about for for a very long time mm-hmm. um but but yeah i mean that's just that's just kind of um like the tldr of you know when, when it comes to like education and when it comes to like different narratives like how people are kind of thinking about bitcoin and why they're thinking about it yeah yeah, I agree. And we we touch on so many things in this in this episode. It's just impossible. We're just scratching the the surface here. And that's why, you know, I love also through this podcast, just, you know, whether folks know you or not, just introducing folks to people and then the amount of times people follow up. They they read into things that you're mentioning. They look into different resources and and connect with you both. So um excited for that. But uh, you know, before we before we conclude, just wanted to see if you had any final thoughts or messages about um what you're trying to articulate for, for Gen Z, um, thoughts about Bitcoin in this next year, you know, a lot of these incentives, as you mentioned, um, 99% sure there's going to be some sort of price action on Bitcoin, uh, soon or within the next year that might make people scratch their heads and either amplify the messages against it, seeing like, see, like, it's just this black rock tool to burn the, uh, burn the planet. Or they're like, huh, that's, that went up quite a bit. Um, so what are your, some of your thoughts going into, in the next few months, the next year, um, considering all this and your, uh, your messaging to Gen Z. Yeah, I think mine maybe is a little bit more general. I think a question that, um, was on pretty much every Gen Z's mind or definitely mine is, you know, what am I going to do with my life? Like, what am yeah. I doing? Um, when I heard this in a podcast recently, not a Bitcoin podcast, it was kind of just about life. Um, <gasps> you and listen they to said, other podcasts that aren't yeah, just Bitcoin? I do. <laughs> I actually encourage everyone read other books besides yeah. Bitcoin and podcasts, like do some other stuff too. Anyway, yeah. go ahead. Ella. Um, so anyways, it was just saying, you know, like if you have life, you have purpose. And I think mm-hmm. the greatest, one of the greatest things I've found with Bitcoin is that like capital B Bitcoin, it, it helps you find your purpose or as a tool to let you pursue your purpose. And so I think talking to Gen Z, like, you know, if you're just very surface level on Bitcoin, that is completely fine. Um, but just don't overlook Bitcoin as a tool to help you just find your purpose, live the life um, that you'd like to live and continually, honestly, like being able to ask, what am I going to do with my life? The ability mm-hmm. to change and not just be tied to something that maybe you don't love. So, yeah, I think just TLDR, like if you have life, you have purpose and Bitcoin helps you really find that, pursue that purpose. Yeah. Arsh, what are your, what's your uh, imparting wisdom, even though I'd love to continue talking with you guys at other points we'll we'll definitely do this again yeah definitely um i think you know like i touched on earlier um you know people may you know a lot of gen z like may come back like like well let's put a timeline for like you know like you said next couple months in in the in the short future in the next year or so right like i think as you know a lot of the you know problems that are surrounding our generation continue to amplify um themselves like i'm i'm certain that that people will will keep on taking looks at um bitcoin um if you know it's done in a in a a welcoming way like i feel like a lot of gen z um wants to kind of like 
be procedural through um, a, a process when learning. Um, and I think that if we continue to like evolve tools and if we continue to push education out there that, you know, brick by brick, um, people, people will start to like become curious about it and, um, you know, want to learn about it. And, and the sooner, um, they actually, you know, maybe, maybe look into it, but, but may not go down the surface. I think it's just like about them scratching the surface and being able to, um, you know, identify that Bitcoin exists and, and what it does and why, why it happens. Um, so I think the, the sooner that happens, um, the, the better and, um, with the tools that we're trying to create and, um, you know, with other organizations alike, um, I think it's, it's inevitable that, you know, people start to look into Bitcoin, um, you know, through, through the educational tools, whether that's for, um, you know, why Bitcoin or whether that's, you know they're attracted to the price for for one way or another. Like people, people have different reasons of coming into Bitcoin, uh, which is totally fine. M- more reasons, the merrier, right? So, um, yeah, I think I think that's that's definitely what keeps me hopeful, um, and I'm I'm really looking forward to the next you know couple of years and you know see see Bitcoin evolving for sure. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you both for jumping on. This was this was super fun. And, and please, you know, always let let me know any ways that we can amplify the message of Generation Bitcoin and what you're you're both doing. The whole group um, be happy to do that, and we'll, we'll definitely have to talk again soon. But but thank you both so much for jumping on. Yeah. No, thank you, Trey, for yeah. having us. This was so nice. Thanks for having us, Trey. We'll we'll stay in touch. Absolutely.